Hello and welcome to WISE. I'm Rosie Acosta. WISE stands for Women Inspiring Success and Empowerment. This is a 10-part podcast series featuring interviews with successful, inspirational women in business, art, entertainment, and more. Think of your definition of success in your head right now. Go ahead, I'll wait. Does it involve a good job? A bunch of zeros in your bank account? Fame? A family? Or something else? Many people view success as a zero-sum game. In order for me to succeed, someone else has to fail or suffer. I want my piece of the pie. On an intellectual level, we know that this is mostly false. My neighbor and I can both own a nice car, have a nice home if we really wanted to. But where does that narrative come from on an emotional level? Perhaps there was some truth to it. Thousands of years ago, sharing your hunt or your harvest with your neighbor meant less food for you and your family. More importantly, who has defined success for you? Is it something that you came up with all on your own or have your experiences with family or teachers or bosses shaped what you view as a successful life? Today, we have the honor of sitting with Melissa Hunter, writer, actor, and producer, most notably known for The Santa Clarita Diet and Maya and Marty, which earned her a WGA Award nomination. She's also the writer and producer on the new show Marvel's She-Hulk, coming soon to Disney+. Melissa and I discuss success, abundance, perseverance, and jealousy. A great conversation. Without further ado, here's Melissa Hunter. I the I found you because Cleo Wade reposted a quote mm-hmm. that you that you had posted. Yeah. Um I mean I was a, a fan of I was a fan of um Santa Clarita Diet. Oh yeah. So I I'd already known who you were. Uh-huh. But then when I saw her post that I was like, "Oh man, like this girl, she she's my spirit animal. Like I have to meet her. I have to talk to her. That's like so I nice. think that there is But I feel like in what I was saying earlier about this particular podcast and what I'm trying to find, like it's actually been interesting to see how much work it's it's been to find women mm-hmm. in different fields yeah. that are really thriving, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And I feel like now with the paradigm shifting and more people being aware that there needs to be more women directors, there needs mm-hmm. to be more women writers, there needs to be more um, women showcased in all of these different arts and different mm-hmm. fields, you know, like we are definitely seeing it more in the wellness world, you know, or even in the yoga world, all the big gurus yeah, are all male. Yeah, that's not surprising. Right. Mm-hmm. And to me, I'm, I'm like, the majority of the practitioners are women. Where are the, where are the women gurus? Like, where are the women sages? Like, yeah. where are they, you know? Especially because it feels like such a feminine sort of experience of intuition and warmth yes. and mm-hmm. not that men can't have that, of but course. it feels counterintuitive that there aren't more women right. leading that field. Yeah. And, you know, I, I definitely feel like, well, the, the prayer is that that begins to shift. So mm-hmm. anyway, back to the quote that Cleo oh, yeah. reposted. So can you, can you tell us what the quote was about? You, you don't have to read it exact, but. Yeah, so I, God, I should have looked at it before I came <laughs> here. But I said, I said in 2020, I would love for, aside from the 30 under 30 next gen list, I would love to, we, I would love to see lists about women and and people over a certain age, middle age people having successes later in life. Like that's the list we want. And I think I said that in all caps. And I'm very much misquoting myself, but roughly that's what it said. Uh, and you know, it came out of a moment of being frustrated and feeling kind of sad like you know we we go to social media it's like as a way of self-punishment sometimes when Mm -hmm. we're feeling anxious or sad we want to look at the reason why we're feeling anxious or sad I feel like it's a self-fulfilling sort of loop that we get Mm -hmm. into 
And I think one day I was feeling sad about something that had happened in my job or my career. And I was just reading these, the, the list of like the next gen list and the 30 under 30 list. And I'm in my mid thirties and it made me feel the same way. It makes me feel every year since I was 25 that I, that it's too late or mm -hmm. that I, I missed it. Like that there, I missed the window where I could be, where I could achieve my dreams. Right. And it's not true. Like I am working in my field and I have plenty more to go and I feel like I'm just beginning. But when I see those, those kinds of lists, it makes me feel, it gives that, it gives me that sense of hopelessness that, you know, the anxiety, my anxiety brain mm -hmm. likes to feed on. And I realize like the times I feel inspired are hearing about people who take a left turn in their life or they undergo all the hardship and they, they come out in a new chapter mm -hmm. or they've been working at something their whole lives and then at 50 it happens like that's those are the inspirational stories to me not that there's anything wrong with the people that achieve great things in their 20s like that's incredible and it should be celebrated but we can hold both at the same time yeah I totally agree and, and obviously like I reposted that and mm -hmm. I was I, we're in the same age demographic uh -huh. and I totally agree with that. I think it's so unfortunate for us to not honor every stage of life in yeah. the same way. Like, mm -hmm. you know, Forbes is 40 under 40 or Forbes 50 under 50 or mm -hmm. Forbes 60 under 60. Like, yeah. why is it only 20s? and under 30 mm -hmm. that we celebrate because, and I know obviously, I don't want to say obviously because we don't know if we can change society or not, but we can. I think society mm -hmm. is changing. Actually, I'm a serial optimist. Mm -hmm. So I like to think we get an opportunity to talk about it. And I think the more that we talk about it, the more that we can have these conversations. And I think the most difficult thing is playing that comparison game, right? Yes, like comparison absolutely. is the biggest joy kill. Mm -hmm. And especially with things like social media, when we're out there seeing, you know, these types of lists and we feel like, especially when you're not having a good day, right? Yeah, and that's often when we do seek it out is when we're not having a good day. Like I don't, I know I'm not on Instagram a lot when I'm having a fantastic day, you know? <laughs> right, because you're having a fantastic day. <laughs> because I'm busy day. having fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, these lists do feel like a microcosm of what the, that sort of comparing culture that social media has introduced to us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it makes us get into these negative thought patterns that can become very reaffirmed when we look at the highlight reel of re reels of everyone's lives and, you know, the way algorithms are designed to show you either the, the best or the worst of things or the things that people are commenting on the yeah. most and liking the most, those are often the things that are people's successes. And when you're having a bad day and all you see is everyone you, per, you perceive you know having a good day, it makes you feel like you've done something wrong. Um, and I think these lists, it's, you know, it, it also, I think... There, I feel like we celebrate like these miracles, right? These people at 22 that started this business that, you know, is the next Uber or, yeah. you know, made a film that went, that was the darling of Sundance or something like that. And it feels like those are exceptions, not, those are not the rule. And sometimes it's this raw talent that got there at the right moment. And sometimes, you know, their parents gave them seed money yeah. or they're all not that that's wrong, but it's right. just there are so many factors that we don't see. see? Oh. And and so we can create this narrative for ourselves that we're not talented enough or smart enough or driven enough or it's too late or we're not enough. And I think... I think it's it's not great for us. Yeah, no, um, it's not ideal. No. I I feel like if we focus more time on 
exploring what the entire picture is as opposed to just those moments when mm -hmm. we're looking at other people's lives, I think it would give us a deeper understanding and perhaps create less despair for yeah. our own lives, mm -hmm. right? Because all we do is compare everybody's outsides to our insides, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, absolutely. How do you think that, I mean, I'm just, in your career and in your life, it part of us being able to cultivate a deep sense of wisdom or learning is understanding how our own relation to certain things are, like how our own experience is going to inform our decision making. Uh-huh. Right? So for you, like, what has been the biggest lesson that you've learned in your career? And I know that's a loaded big question, but what's been the biggest lesson that you've learned um, in your career? And you've acted, you're, you're, right, you're a writer, you're mm -hmm. an actor, um, you're an artist, you're a creative, you're mm -hmm. a storyteller. What has been the biggest lesson that you've learned that has allowed you to have that more wider perspective on just life? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I feel like I can think of so many, it, it calls to mind so many different moments that I've had, but I think as a whole, the biggest lesson that I've learned or that I've worked toward is learning how to um, deal with and how to reframe rejection mm. because I feel like in in my industry and I know in plenty others too but especially in the entertainment industry rejection is 95 percent of the job like you get told no 95 percent of the time if you're doing well and you know every tv show that you've ever seen win emmys and all that stuff they probably got told no on that show 20 times before they got the yes. And I think if you, it, it really is, this, this business really is a marathon, not a race. And that's why it is interesting in connection with the 30 under 30 list mm -hmm. that like, even if you get success at an early age, if you can't learn how to embrace rejection, you will flame out. And if you can't learn that at any stage, it's just, it's just too hard to, to take it. You can't take it personally. You can't create narratives that, um, that feed into, you know, this sort of negative self-talk. You have to learn how to live beside your rejection. And I think, you know, I've had many experiences of things that, um, projects or auditions or things that I've gotten really close to or, I made a pilot for True TV and I wrote it, I starred in it, we shot it, and then I waited for eight weeks and then they said no to making it a series. And that was probably the hard, it felt like a breakup, like it, especially not just from the hope of it going forward, but, um, but with this idea that I loved so much and this story that I wanted to tell. And there are so many gatekeepers along the way. But looking back, that was now three years ago, I see how that experience taught me so much about how to be a writer, how to make a show, how to wear a bunch of different hats, how to feel confident in my skin. But also now that I'm far enough away, I'm, I don't think that was the story I wanted to tell. I think that was the story I wanted to tell then, but... I'm glad it wasn't the one that I was shooting for six years because yeah. I think there were reasons why it wasn't right for the time. And I think when you learn how to live with rejection, it's twofold. Either it wasn't the right thing and you have to kind of take the feedback from the outside world and not take it personally, but still understand what you can do to improve your art or what you're trying to say, or what you want to do, or you push forward and you don't let that one no mean that it's 
a bad idea or that you are doing something wrong. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Oh, no, 100 percent. I I totally agree with everything that you're saying. And I think mostly what I find fascinating because I can totally relate to that. And it's hindsight's always 2020, 20, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. When you can look back and say, oh, OK. But in that moment, you're just totally, like you said, heartbroken. Yeah. And the rejection doesn't feel good. Mm-hmm. But I but I, I agree with you. I don't know that there's anything that's ever not worked out that I look back on and think, oh, I still wish that that would have worked Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, totally. I think it, you know, and, and it's usually like you're, you're giving yourself space mm-hmm. for either and time for something new or for a reinvention of this thing that you were, that you wanted to do. Excuse me. I mean, I, I had a job interview in the fall and then I had, and I didn't get it. And then a month later I had a job interview for She-Hulk for the Marvel show that I did get. And it was, I'm so happy it ended up being that show. And I was so upset about the other one. So it, it is like, there's all that, I think it's the reminder that opportunity is, is bountiful and that it isn't a pie where everyone's getting a piece and you don't have the piece. It's an ocean. And I think if you try to see it that way, you kind of let go of things that maybe you were holding too tightly onto. Yeah. Oh, I love that so much yeah. because I feel like it's, it changes the framework in your perspective to be more abundant as opposed to lack. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like even thinking about the list, right? I get it. I, I feel the same way when I see those lists and I'm just like, oh, like, oh, mm-hmm. like that's not, I'm not there yet or I'm not where I want to be in my career. You know, you start to question whether what you're doing is correct or whether you're on the right path, yeah. right? You start to question everything. And it's just one, one feedback. Yes. You know, one, one little asset of feedback. It's uh-huh. not the whole, uh, you know, you're not, it's not your whole entire career is not under review from this one list. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's something that like, it doesn't, it matters to the people that are on the list. It will help them and it will be exciting for them, but it does not matter that you did not get on that list. You know what I mean? It's like, that doesn't, there isn't a negative effect there. Right. And I think, you know, going back to the pie of it all, like, that's where jealousy gets involved or gets and and turns into envy where it's like you see someone get a job or, or get on a list and you're like, why didn't I get that? Why not me? And if you let go of that and think of, you know what? I would love to have something like that in the future. And I'm so happy for them. I feel like jealousy is such an interesting sort of beast to tackle in this industry and in every industry um, where you can hold two things to be true, right? You can hold happiness for someone that you know or that you've seen that deserves something while also wanting something. Like, I know for me, I remember it, this year when I, it was another thing of like seeing the list of people that, uh, of movies that got into Sundance. And I was looking through and I felt this pang of jealousy and I had to recognize that I was feeling that way and think, but I didn't make a movie this year. You know, like I didn't, why am I feeling jealous right now? <laughs> that feels crazy. I thought right? you were going to say, and my film wasn't on there. And I was like, oh, did you make a film? No, no. I did not. Oh, okay, I get <laughs> but it. it was, Still valid. But it was a lesson, mm-hmm. right? It was, oh, I think that jealousy is just telling me that I want to make a movie. And what are the steps I can take today, this week, this month, this year to reach that goal. And I think jealousy can be really informing. Again, if you reframe it as like, what is the lesson here? Why am I feeling this way? And what positive steps can I take for myself instead of being angry that this person got it, you know, Um, to reach those goals? It can be really informing, I think. Yeah. Where, for your own ability. I mean, you are obviously extremely wise. I think so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, where, 
I'm like, where did you learn that? Who inspired you to be that introspective? Gosh, um, I mean, I think I had, I, or I know I have very wonderful parents and it was a very sort of emotions forward household yeah. um, where we talked about how we felt and, you know, I have one sister and we're very close and she's an actress and my mom is an actress. And so it was very like creative sort of household where we sort of felt our feelings. Um, and then I feel like the reason why I've always been drawn to theater originally and acting and writing is this exploration of the human experience. And that's something that I feel like has always been driving me. And it's only really in retrospect that I understand that. Mm. Um, so I think I've always been seeking that in my work. And then the other place is through therapy. I mean, I just, I, I'm such a huge advocate for therapy and I, I think it's very, uh, Interesting to me that sometimes when I talk about my therapist to certain people, they kind of clam up and act like I'm talking about my period, which right. I will also talk about my period. Exactly. But it's like it's taboo. And I just, I wish everyone could be in therapy because Ditto. I think being, being a human on this planet in 2020 is a very <laughs> weird and stressful time. And I started going to therapy six years ago. And it's really just, again, I think it, the combination of dealing with my own struggles with anxiety and then with the work that I do, it's trying to learn why I feel a certain way, why a friend is behaving mm -hmm. a certain way, why I'm acting out, why someone else is, like how dynamics work. I think I just have always had a thirst and fascination and also have a very good therapist who can help explain it all to me. Yeah, no, yeah. that's wonderful. I, I'm all for therapy and mm -hmm. healing modalities of all kinds. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I feel that the more support we have from everyone, I mean, this tribe mentality, I feel like is a thing. I think mm -hmm. it's important to have a good, even if it's not your own family, to have your chosen family, mm -hmm. you know, have people around you that support you and mm -hmm. make you feel connected. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I love that. I think my next question would be, who is the most inspiring woman in your life? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think I have a few. My mom is certainly at the top of the list. I think she's someone that she was always such a great, enthusiastic mother growing up and so present and so creative. And I think now as an adult, I realize how hard that can be and how I never saw the cracks. And I wish that, you know, I wish that I had because she was so so strong for me all the time. And then I think one thing that I find, found very inspiring about her life is, you know, she's once, my sister went to college, she never finished her college degree and she went back to UCLA and finished her college degree in her 50s. Uh, and she and my sister graduated from UCLA at the same time. Oh my God, I love that. So she has just such a determination and spunk about her that I think has always sort of made me feel sometimes way more confident than I deserve to be and like walk into a room in a way that I feel like a lot of women are told not to walk into a room, you know, with a bit of bravado. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really helped me along the way. Um, yeah, I'm just, I think I'm just gonna stick to my mind. I mean, I have a yeah. lot of friends too. I think I'm con I have such a tight knit, group of girlfriends and not necessarily all in one group, but just like many that I think feed me in a way that I need, that, that I feel like I'm so grateful for, like we're talking about the wisdom before. I think they are so wise mm -hmm. and we talk so freely and so openly about our feelings, about, about existential themes in our, in the world. And I think that 
and without judgment. And I think mm-hmm. that is very hard to find. Yeah, it is. And I think in my 20s, early 20s and high school, college, I was always chasing being friends with mean girls or, or just girls that weren't nice um, and kind of letting go of that and embracing the people that make me feel good about who I am while I feel good about who they are, I think is so important. Yeah. Oh, I love that. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or is preventing you from achieving your goals? I know that the last couple of months for me and a lot of people I know, it has been such an emotional upheaval up and down. This is coming from somebody who's been in and out of therapy for the last 15 years. BetterHelp will help assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not a self-help. It's a professional counseling service done straight online. There's a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas, especially with a lot of things being closed down right now. The service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get a timely and thoughtful response. Plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. So you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so that they make it easy for you and free to change counselors if you need. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily. Visit betterhelp.com forward slash wise. That's better H-E-L-P and join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. Today, they're offering our listeners for the WISE podcast 10% off of your first month if you visit betterhelp.com forward slash WISE. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com forward slash wise w i s e to get 10 percent off of your first month so my workout schedule has been rather hectic lately and i'm noticing it's starting to really wear me down and even though i'm getting all my workouts in practicing yoga nidra and meditation and doing whatever i can to keep my stress levels low i can still feel like i'm stressed no one likes feeling stressed out and even worse how it can affect the people closest to you But lately I've been doing something a little different and it's been helping me feel great again. A friend of mine who recently recovered from an absolute burnout told me that it wasn't time off or more rest or a secret relaxation technique that saved him. This is where it gets really interesting. He said that all he did was add a mineral to his diet based upon his doctor's recommendation. I was hooked. So I asked him, of course, what mineral was it? And he told me that he was recommended a super dose of magnesium. You see, magnesium is the fourth most abundant mineral in the human body. Since the nutrient is responsible for three to 600 different biochemical reactions in the body, including metabolism, when your levels are low, you struggle with sleep, energy, metabolism, pain, and stress. You can get magnesium from certain foods like black beans, nuts, avocado, spinach, and more, but if you really wanna make sure you get enough magnesium for what your body needs, I recommend using a supplement in addition to these foods. Now, before you go research magnesium supplements, know this. Most magnesium supplements fail to help you beat stress for two primary reasons. The first, they are synthetic, unnatural, and not recognized by your body. And two, they are not full spectrum, meaning they don't have all seven forms that you need. So today I want to introduce you to the best magnesium supplement I've found. It's the most potent, complete, first full spectrum magnesium formula ever created. It's called Magnesium Breakthrough. Magnesium Breakthrough is a complete formula that includes naturally derived forms of all seven forms of supplemental magnesium, and it doesn't contain any synthetic additives or preservatives. This is the most potent oral magnesium you will ever find, period. Many notice a sense of calm, relaxation, their nervous system and stress levels are soothed, and better sleep is often observed within the first week. If used daily and as instructed, most people use magnesium breakthrough in the morning, which is when I like to use it, 
to help them stay calm and resilient to deal with the day. And even within three to five weeks, most people experience a level of peace and serenity that they haven't felt in a very long time. I highly recommend trying Magnesium Breakthrough for at least 30 days to see how it will make a difference in your mood or stress levels. Today, you can get 10% off with a special WISE podcast coupon code when you visit biooptimizers.com forward slash WISE and enter the code WISE10. That's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S forward slash W-I-S-E and use the promo code WISE10. And now back to our show. Wisdom, does wisdom come at any age or do you feel like there's a certain type of wisdom that comes after you've been on this planet for a certain amount of years? I think for most people, wisdom comes with age. I think that I believe I'm way more wise than I was 10 years ago because I think I was so concerned. I was so insecure and just so self-involved in that way of how insecurity, you don't realize that it makes you so inward turning. Mm. And I think once you are able as best you can to kind of let go of that, you can see the world a little bit more clearly. But I, but I do think, and I've met many of them, that there are people who have had incredible hardship at an early age that have made them, as they say, wise beyond their years, mm -hmm. that I do think that is another kind of wisdom that is different than that which we learn yeah. over time. Because those people who have had childhood traumas or what have you, they have to grow up in ways that a lot of people don't, like that I didn't have to, you know? Right. And I really respect that kind of wisdom as well. Yeah, um, I agree. I, I think the same. I, you know, for a long time, I, I thought, you know, as, as I was saging, mm -hmm. um, we celebrate youth so much mm -hmm. and we don't necessarily talk about um saging in in a positive way it's it's all mm -hmm. always like oh what can i do different how can i do a different treatment or how can i yeah. inject shit into my face or i mean mm -hmm. no offense like people do whatever yeah. do, do what makes you happy mm -hmm. you know i'm not saying i'll never do it because mm -hmm. who knows how in five years like i might be doing yeah. whatever's gonna make me feel good and it's mm -hmm. like i'm all about it you know but i feel like it it comes from a place of wanting something that else mm -hmm. like it's like i'm gonna reach for something that is not in the present moment you know? Yes. Well, it's also, I mean, there's nothing wrong with, with, you know, Botox or plastic surgery or what have you, but it, it, it's impermanent. Like it will eventually, like in my mid thirties, I see so many people that are, you know, starting that process. Mm -hmm. And I think about how that's only going to get harder as you get older. And there, and again, there's nothing wrong with it, but it, the work I feel like has to be in inward out because eventually we're all, if we're if we're lucky we're all going to be ninety year old women, you know, with wrinkles everywhere yeah. and you know a sort of amorphous body shape yeah, totally. and want and be happy, you know. And I think we uh, us learning how to sort of let go of what is forced upon women. Yeah of the expectations of beauty and thinness and, yeah. you know, everything else that it's, it's finding what your happiness inside. And then, you know, getting a little Botox if you want it. You yeah. Know? Like do whatever, do whatever's going to make you happy. Mm -hmm. What I find fascinating is that when I speak to women of a certain age, uh, they just don't care. You just stop caring, uh -huh. right? It's like, you just don't, they just don't care. It's like, yeah. oh, just live life. Like I learned, you know, one of the biggest lessons that a dear friend of mine says that she's learned and she's, you know, she's closer to 70, mm -hmm. you know, but she is, she said, I, I, what I wish that I would have done at your age 
is to care less about what my outside look like. She's like, I wasted yeah. so much brain space and energy and time worried about my outsides and what I look like as opposed to just being able to enjoy my life. She's like, mm -hmm. now, like, I wish that I had the the surrender that I have now back then because I would have enjoyed, I would have been happier. I would have enjoyed my life more. Yeah, totally. You it's know. that radical self-love right. and acceptance. And I think what I aspire to do, I don't always succeed, is, you know, focus on being being and feeling healthy mm -hmm. and having that guide my fitness and my nutrition and my versions of self-care that, you know, I feel like for years, especially in my twenties, I was really focused on being thin and like the way I would do that was so unhealthy. And, you know, but it was also very easy to do it in your early twenties. Of course. <laughs> you just like don't eat, don't eat or don't skip breakfast or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and then drink a lot and feel hungover and don't eat all day. Like, it's just like very, like I was not healthy. Uh, but yeah, I mean, and now it's like, if I have two glasses of wine the whole next day, I'm like, Oh boy. <laughs> and I feel bad that I like, can't go on a run, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's things change, you know, things like change. things change. And I feel like it's, but I do think once I started reframing like exercise specifically, which was always in my 20s, it did feel like a punishment like, that I was mm. doing to myself of like that I need to do this in order to have this outcome. Yeah. And now I found exercise, exercises that make me feel it, like revitalized and strong and it helps my mood and my mm. energy and it doesn't feel like that anymore. Yeah. If you could give your 20 year old self a piece of advice from you right now to oh, that, to that, that 20 year old Melissa, uh -huh. what would you say to her? I, I think I would say to not worry about what people think because the, the people that like you will like you and the people that understand what you have to offer will see that and the people that don't won't so who cares about them I think I spent so much time trying to get people to like me and worrying about what people thought of me and trying to get into x thing and you know and I was so in my own head all the time. And I feel like if I let go of that and just was more myself, I would have, it, it would have been a lot more fun. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Again, it's the hindsight's always 20, yeah. 20, you know, yeah. I feel like part of us being able to acquire, collect or, or garner wisdom has to do with those lessons, those things that you learn. Yeah. And I think, you know, to that end, you know, I have no regret about what I did in my early 20s, but I think art, it, you can get so in your own way if you get caught up with what people will think and whether it's, and being afraid of whether it's going to be bad mm -hmm. and whether people, like, it's not going to be received well. You know, if you, I feel like I didn't start writing until my early 20s. I was always a writer, you know, I didn't write in college or in high school, but I had like journals of just like, I was writing all the time. And I think I was so afraid to let my voice out there. And in my early twenties, I was still kind of going after trying to see like, oh, do, are people responding to this? You know, it was easier to be in a group where I could test little things out. And then I'm finally made my web series adult wednesday adams which was um in 2014 and, and you started in as well yes yeah and that was the first thing that people that i wrote on my own that people really responded to and i think it was around then where i really was kind of shedding that fear of of expectation and what people would think if it was bad and I was just like, you know what, if it's bad, who cares? No one's going to think about it in a week, you know? 
Um, yeah. Yeah, I feel like we have way more success when you just don't care. Yeah, absolutely. I think especially entertainment industry is so reactive mm -hmm. to what's successful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if the, the most successful thing, people will be like, well, how do we how do we do another one of those? Like, that's what a studio will think. Right. right. How do we make, make the next Parasite now that Parasite has won Best Picture? But it's like, no one can make the next Parasite because <laughs> right. it was, it, it, it's its own creation. Like Bong Joon-ho, he was making those kinds of movies forever. It's just, it was the one that people paid attention to. And I think in comedy, a lot of times you'll see something that works and you'll try to play at that. But like... For example, if it's, let's say, John Mulaney, a stand-up who I love, if someone was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do stand-up like John Mulaney, you know who's going to do better stand-up than that? John Mulaney. He's going to do the best John Mulaney stand-up, you know? Uh, and I think what you have to do is, like, tap into yourself and get rid of the external noise and just write and create from your own experience and with your own voice in a kind of fearless way, which is yeah. really hard. Yeah. I'm, and how for you, like, aside from having a good support system, um, what do you do on a daily basis to keep that, keep your perspective on being optimistic or positive? Yeah. Um, what do I do when I'm working or? Yeah, like what do you do on on a daily, like you, you mentioned earlier, if you're having a good day, you're not on Instagram because uh -huh. you're too busy enjoying your day. Mm -hmm. Like, do you have any like rituals that you do on a daily basis that keep you on that frequency? Because like we're all, all everybody has an off day, right? Like yeah. one day I can be feeling really good and just so grateful for my life and like the fact that I'm alive or that mm -hmm. I get to do something that I love and it's as amazing. And other times I'm just like, I'm not where I want to be in my career. Like yeah. I need to be doing this or I need to be doing something else or like, why hasn't this happened mm -hmm. yet? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think my best days, so I have sort of a unique, I guess it's not unique. It's a kind of a freelance lifestyle, right? So half the year, if it's a good year, I'll be working in a writer's room. And then the other half, I'll be writing and developing my own stuff. And that half, when I'm not in a writer's room, is when my mind can get the best of me or my anxiety ah. can because I'm not busy, you know, and I'm not, I'm good, very good in a structured environment. Um, I love a deadline. I love like having people around that I'm accountable to. And so when I'm on the other side of it, I, I, I try to set up a life where I still have routine and ritual. And for me, one of the most important things is just getting outside and moving my body in any way that I can. Even if it's just a walk, uh, like you know, if it's a long walk while I'm listening to music, I love hiking and I try to hike as much as possible, especially in the morning. Uh, first thing, in the, I need to move my body first thing in the morning. I think that's a really key part of my time a frame uh, framework and uh, mindset. And then the other piece of it I've learned is. I am an extroverted person and I'm not someone that can sit holed up in my apartment or in an office by myself all day. That is when I start getting, uh, like I, that's when I start going just towards social media and yeah. stuff like that, distractions. Um, so I joined this co-working space, The Wing, which I love, and I have friends that are there. And so for me, I... I need a little bit of interaction with people that I love every day, like with friends or whoever else. Like if I don't have a day where I'm going to be around people, I'll like call my best friend who lives in D.C. or my sister and have a long conversation. I'm someone that needs that kind of connection. Um, yeah, I think those are the two key parts that yeah. set up a good I love day that you me. know what you need to keep you yeah. on a good frequency. Totally. Well, I mean, that is, again, therapy lesson where I'm going to keep talking about my therapist, basically plugging her. She's a sponsor of this podcast. Um, but 
Yeah, it seems like <laughs> what she taught me about because I'm an extroverted person, what happens is when I'm alone, I'm like my brain and my anxiety, I'm really seeking connection still. Yeah. So that's why I go to social media to find that connection. Right. But if I'm out in the world with people around me, I feel less of a desire to go seek it out. Yeah. Um, so it keeps me more productive. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. So I have uh, just a couple of final questions. Obviously, oh, I could yeah. sit here and chat with you forever. Same. We're on the couch. Mm -hmm. this it's is very exciting. comfy. There's a <laughs> dog right there. There's another dog somewhere else. <laughs> Dogs everywhere. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask you um, kind of like a not rapid fire, but. Oh, boy. Here we okay. go. She got, she got prepped. Let me just sit up. Um, <laughs> okay. So I'm going to say a word and then you'll tell me what your definition is or like what's the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Um, ready? So you're going to say a word and I'm going to say what the definition is. Yeah, like what like your definition is, not like <laughs> what like the a, Webster's Dictionary uh -huh, says. Mm -hmm. Marianne Webster, right? Mm -hmm. um, what is wisdom? I think wisdom is intelligence merging with experience. I think that we can learn as much as we can through, you know, just being a smart, but then when it sort of collides with having certain experiences in your life, it can level the whole, the whole feeling up to wisdom. Mm, I love that. What is inspiration? Inspiration is... I feel like it's an experience of hope through other people, through that you see through the lens of other people. Thank you. What is success? <sighs> I think, well, <laughs> that was a long <laughs> sigh. I think what I've learned about success is that it comes in so many forms that it is undefinable and that if you try to put a definition toward it you will never reach it um, I think that it comes from a place of contentedness within that you can only get by working inside mm. from the inside out love that yeah how do you feel the most empowered I feel the most empowered when I am surrounded by a network or a community of people who want to lift each other up. Um, and I think that includes me wanting to lift other people up while they also want to lift me up. All right, final question. Okay. What piece of wisdom would your 90-year-old self tell you now? Oh, my gosh. That's a tough one. Um, well, I think I will take it from my late grandmother, who lived until she was 95. And I loved her very much, and I still do, and I carry her around all the time. Uh, and she would always say, don't worry so much. We're here for, what did they say? We're here for a good time, not for a long time. Love yeah. That. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. You're amazing. You're I, amazing. I'm so grateful that you agreed to do this. Yeah, thank you. You let us stalker you. Yeah, of course. Thank um, you for having me. I so, feel so grateful. For the people that are listening to this or watching us on video, um, <laughs> Where can they go to connect with you or for more information they want to learn more about you? Yeah, you can go. My Twitter is at Melissa FTW. I'm also on Instagram at Melissa Hunter. Um, you can go to my website. It's MelissaHunter.com. I made it extra complicated. None of them are the same. But that's what happens when you have a name like Melissa Hunter. And there are a lot of us out there. <laughs> is there a I lot? Know. They're taking notes. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. 
So all of those links, those complex links will be on the info button. If you're listening to this um, on whatever platform you're listening to this on, if you go to the info button, all of Melissa's links will be on there. We'll put those on there. If you're watching this on YouTube, then you'll just go into the description and all of those links will be there. Um, please be sure to share this with all of your friends mm -hmm. or um, just anyone who you think would listen because this was really good. It yeah, was really good. Yeah, it was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rosie. Yay. Thank you so much for listening to The Wise Podcast. And thank you to Melissa for joining us. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. We really appreciate your support. This podcast is produced by me, Rosie Acosta, and Aviv Rubenstein. You can find Aviv on Instagram at Rambo Calarician. Join us next week for another episode. This is your host, Rosie Acosta. Peace. <laughs>